representative from another prestigious institution is here to see you. A what? Send him in. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting, attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. If you like this video, please do me a favor, interact with it, give it a like, a share, a subscribe, a thumbs up, a something. Give me something, and, uh, and I will give you an unlimited supply of entertainment in like 15 minutes or so. Thanks. You got yourself a deal, buddy. To be fair, I don't know how entertaining it's going to be, but bear with me. I'm trying to give you the best I can. Today, what I want to talk a little bit about is digital technology and how that affects art. Digital media in art. Uh, there are lots of media that are out there that artists dabble in. You know, you've got your typical standards. You know, you have your painting, your drawing, your sculptures, your ceramics, your your photography. Your I mean, there's all kinds of media that artists create using. And in the 21st century, and a little further back, digital media has become more and more and more a part of what we do and how we do business as artists. So today, I want to give uh, fair... Uh, you know, fair and balanced sort of um, time to those that dabble in digital media. This is a digital media. You know, I, I talk with my, my wife and my family about me making art, and part of what I make as an artist is I make graphic designs. I have uh, designs that I have put on to t-shirts and other things like that. For example, Hey friends, don't forget that there is Art 101 and Mr. Burger merch available. Just check out the links down below. Thank you very much. Adorable. But also, I make other graphics for other things, and, and I do things, uh, you know, uh, commission work and things like that. But I also, uh, you know, make videos and, and do a lot of different types of things. So today what I'd like to do is talk to you just a little bit about digital media in, uh, as it relates to the fine arts. As we begin to explore digital media, it is important to first note that these media are so popular that those in authority feel that it is in the public's best interest that they are very closely monitored. It is also important to note that creative artists have been experimenting with film and digital media for generations. In this video, we're going to examine some of the various approaches artists have taken to create their art in the media of film, digital arts, and graphic design. No. Hmm. Look Arnie, at that. Arnie, what are you watching? Oh, it's a great old movie, Bert. The art of cinema has roots going all the way back to 1872, when Leland Stanford, the founder of Stanford University, took a bet. He bet another man that when a horse was running, all four hooves came off of the ground at some point. Photographer Edward Maybridge was hired to set the record straight on this bet. He lined up a series of still cameras closely together along a racetrack. Each camera's shutter was connected to a string that was released by the horse as it ran by. The resulting photographs of a horse in motion proved that all four hooves did indeed leave the ground at some point as the horse ran. Later, Maybridge discovered a way to project the image in a rapid succession in a device that he called the Zupraxiscope. As the novelty of this concept caught on to other creative people, cinematography would become the resulting birth. And now, our feature presentation. Today's movies are visual experiences, but then again, they have always been a two-dimensional image that moves. Inconceivable. 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 You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. A movie works through the mechanics of the eye. The retina holds the image for a fraction of a second after the image is removed. 
When the images are shown quickly, we see it as one continuous motion, or a persistence of vision. Much of the power of film comes from its ability to reconstruct time. Film is not under the same rules as clock time. It can move through the past, present, or future, as well as mix them all up together. Time can stand still or rocket forward. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. We will examine a few of the films from the last century that have highly innovated and or captured some of the important aspects of the culture of their times. George Eastman was the founder of the Kodak Camera and Film Company. His rolled film was used by Thomas Edison to invent a camera that would shoot a continuous series of photographs. These photographs were placed in a loop, creating an infinite pattern of travel. His invention was called the Kintograph, and the film was shown from the Kintoscope cabinet. Auguste and Louis Lemieux improved on Edison's idea by creating the Cinemagraph. This was a camera, processor, and projector that was created in 1895. In 1907, the brothers also invented the chemistry that made it possible for the autochrome plate system, which is the application that allowed color to be added into the photo process. Movies became big business, and in 1910, film was recognized as an art form. By the 1920s, we began to see the development of what we know as a movie star. Douglas Fairbanks, Greta Garbo, and Charlie Chapman were huge. In 1927, a, by modern standards, would be a little bit of a controversial movie came out known as The Jazz Singer. This would be the first movie to have a soundtrack. Films with sound became known as talkie films and quickly became mandatory for any film that people were going to go to see. Wow, <laughs> that's really loud. The first cartoon with sound was Steamboat Willie, created by a little animation guy by the name of Walt Disney. Now beyond Mickey Mouse, other popular talkie stars were Bob Hope, Mae West, and Will Rogers. To forget a little bit about the Great Depression, musicals became big time in the 1930s. Film would again become very, very popular after World War II. 1926 was Hollywood's best year to date in terms of revenue with a little bit of adjustment for inflation. Fast forward to the 50s. This was the decade of the rebels. Marlon Brando, James Dean, and Elvis Presley. Although they had the science to be able to shoot in color, black and white was the preferred method until the 1960s. Films like West Side Story, Planet of the Apes, and Cleopatra would be shot in color and became very, very popular. Films were really geared towards adults by the 1970s. True Grit, The Godfather, and Rocky were highly successful adult films from the 1970s. We also see the advent of the event movie take place, with the first event film being Jaws. In 1977, the Magnetic Video Corporation released the VCR in 50 films through 20th Century Fox. Side note, MASH was their number one seller in 1977. It's an insane asylum and it's your fault! Now I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here, but the 1980s was really the decade of the ugly blockbuster. There were very, very popular films that really weren't that good. And the number one cast of these ugly blockbusters was the Brat Pack. Molly Ringwald, Emilio Estevez, Demi Moore, Anthony Michael Hall, and others were these kid yuppies that were creating these films that were big in my heart but really kind of cinematically unsuccessful. Films like Back to the Future, St. Elmo's Fire, Pretty in Pink, or The Goonies. Now that's not to say that there weren't high quality films. We can look at films like The Temple of Doom, Raging Bull, or Platoon for examples of those. By the 1990s, we would see new technologies with computer graphics emerge. This made films like Forrest Gump, Titanic, and Natural Born Killers possible. In 1997, the DVD would hit the stores and change the way we interact with film. In the 2000s, CGI, or computer-generated imagery, creates realistic effects in a safe and relatively inexpensive manner. Films like The Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia or the Pirates of the Caribbean all use extensive digital aspects for special effects. I assure you our intentions are strictly honorable. 
there is also a trend of retelling old stories for a new CGI generation. King Kong, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Batman Begins, and even True Grit became the target of a reboot for a new generation. The Sony Corporation set the stage for the beginning of video art in 1965 when they introduced the first portable video recording camera. Although this camera was cumbersome, some artists were drawn to the new media. Primarily, the instant feedback of video does away with any sort of developing process. These videos could be stored on inexpensive cassettes, erased, and re-recorded. In addition, because the video signal can be sent to more than one monitor, it allows for flexibility of presentation. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Early video artists were relatively simple, consisting mainly of recording of the artists that were performing themselves, or of a dramatic scene staged with only a few actors and props. Editing was difficult, but they would discover that the medium was most well suited for private screenings. In 1972, the compatibility issue was resolved with the introduction of the standard 3 quarter inch tape. This allows the artist to work with television production equipment and even to be able to broadcast the results of their labor. In the 1980s, there was a great deal of improvements to video technology in the forms of lighter cameras, better color, and computerized editing. In this relatively short history of video art, some artists have tried to expand the limits of the medium's technological capabilities. Nam June Paik, an artist that we've talked about before, frequently used video as a medium in a quasi-humorous fashion to comment on the role of television in our lives, as we can see in his 1986 work, Video Flag Z. In this, he uses 84 television sets in an arrangement that resembles an American flag. On each monitor, portrayals of old Hollywood films flicker endlessly across the screen, as if our national identity is made up of what we've seen in movies, and he might not be far off. One of his students, Bill Viola, is leading the video art movement to this day. In his state-of-the-art technologies, he shows us his mastery and ability in an ever-changing art medium. Without question, Viola is one of the biggest influences in video art from the 1970s until today. His work as a whole looks at things that everyone can relate to, the ideas of birth, death, religion, and so on. His video installations have been the backdrop of Nine Inch Nail concerts, as well as Richard Wagner classical music performances. Smoking. One area of art that is very connected with technology, although its roots are not as intertwined with technological media, is graphic design. The term graphic design refers to the process of working with words and pictures to enhance visual communication. Much of graphic design involves designing material to be printed, including books, magazines, brochures, packages, posters, and imagery for electronic media. Such designs range in scale and complexity from a postage stamp to a billboard. This work is a creative process employing art and technology to communicate ideas. With the control of symbols, type, color and illustration, the graphic designer produces visual compositions meant to attract, inform, and persuade a given audience. A great graphic designer can memorably arrange images and text for the benefit of both. I think you just gotta find something you love to do and then do it for the rest of your life. In an age when the image seems to be about everything, companies will spend money on graphic designs that will present the best identity for their company. A logo is an identifying mark or trademark based on letter forms combined with pictorial elements. Corporations will finally calibrate their logos to present a distinctive and memorable appearance for their company. An organization's logo may evolve over time, reflecting a different cultural climate, a different set of goals, or a new management. When the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, was founded in the late 1950s, the first NASA letterhead used a celestial globe with the Earth, the Moon, and a stylized arrow symbolizing spaceflight. In 1973, with space travel a little bit more commonplace, the logo was changed to the stylized red letters that we identify today they purposefully chose to stylize the A to symbolize a rocket nose cone within the logo. 
In the early 1990s, in the aftermath of federal budget cuts and a demoralized environment caused by the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger, the logo was redesigned again. NASA decided to return to its vision of its original logo, which administrators thought would better exemplify the optimistic and exploratory mood of the administration. What don't you understand about looking this way? It's not f***ing rocket science! Letters, believe it or not, can be an art form. Typography is the art and technique of composing printed material from letters. These are often called typeface or fonts. Just a few decades ago, when people committed words to paper, their efforts were handwritten or typed, and nearly all typewriters had the exact same typeface. Today, anyone who uses a computer can select fonts and create documents that look professional, but computer programs like pencils or paintbrushes or cameras are simply tools. They can facilitate the artistic goals if the creator has artistic sensibilities. Artist Heidi Cody took a more iconic stance with her 2000 work, American Alphabet. She found all 26 letters from initials and corporate logos. An effective poster attracts attention and conveys a message quickly. The creativity of the poster designer is directed toward a specific purpose, which may be to advertise or persuade. The idea of the modern poster is more than 100 years old. In the 19th century, most posters were lithographs and many artists made extra income by designing them. As we have discussed before, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec was one of the most important of these. Early posters were hand-drawn designs. Designers added color by printing them with multiple stones, one stone for each color. Very uh, subtle and very pink. As we look at the printing process, we will slide in a little bit of a look at modern music packaging. Although most people are probably downloading or getting their music more instantly, album packaging is still a big part of our interactions with music. Now musically, The Velvet Underground was way ahead of its time. This band was ranked by Rolling Stone as the number 19 100 Greatest Artists of All Time. This album, their debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico from 1966, was a commercial failure when it was released, and it has become one of the most influential rock albums in history and is placed at number 13 on the Rolling Stone magazine's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. Artistically, the band's short-term manager, Andy Warhol, designed the album cover. And in 2017, Billboard named this album the greatest album cover of all time. <laughs> what? On the original album cover, allowed fans to peel back the banana skin as a sticker. The unique effect was difficult for manufacturers to pull off, but the record label had approved it since Warhol's stamp of approval was bound to go far into the 60s. In our daily lives, we're handling objects and seeing things that might seem just like every day, but they've been designed. Industrial designers work to make useful products that are also beautiful. Design, beauty, utility, and cutting edge technology all rolled into one slick product. Sony, Latin for sound, started the personal audio revolution in 1957 with the TR610 transistor radio. This new radio fit to your hand and came with four flashy color options. A wire hoop could swing out so it could sit on a table like a kickstand. Sony introduced the FM band into its radios the following year. However, Nearly half a million were sold during its existence on the shelves. In the 1970s, they packaged this with headphones and a new cassette technology to develop the Walkman. And in the 80s, they would again revolutionize portable music with the development of the Boombox. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty cool, I guess. We can't talk about technology without talking about Apple. Before the iPhone, the iPad, or the MacBook, we first had the Macintosh. For the first time, this was a sleek design with new technology, the best 1984 could offer. The Apple Macintosh was a new vehicle for creativity. 
Its graphic interface made tasks easier than old command line interfaces, and it had a smaller footprint than most personal desktop computers. It was also one of the first products that was unveiled to the public in what would become an American holiday. On January the 22nd, 1984, in an ad during the third quarter of the Super Bowl, where the Raiders beat the Redskins 38-9 in Tampa, Florida. And this Super Bowl ad was shown and definitely captured the attention of the nation. And this trend would follow suit with every Super Bowl thereafter. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. But design does not end with electronics. It goes forward into other products that we use every single day. What about the unromantic toothbrush? The Oral-B cross-action toothbrush came straight out of Silicon Valley. Research showed that people would hold a toothbrush in one of five ways. The Oral-B company hired Lunar Design to create a toothbrush that could more comfortably fit all five grips while delivering the bristles at a more effective angle for cleaning your teeth. Ergonomics, 3D modeling, and enhanced materials all went in to creating a new brush for 1999. It became the leader of the industry and the standard that all others tried to imitate. <laughs> little reverse psychology. One last thing, let's get into something a little bit further into the 21st century. One of the fastest growing sources of generating energy in my home state of Iowa, as well as across the nation, has been through wind power. One of its downfalls in private home models has been that thousands of bats and birds die each year pursuing insects that are attracted to these wind turbines. Painting the supports, blades, and turbines will deter insects from congregating. The Green Power Utility System line of vertical axis wind turbines from Diamond Wind Solutions not only offers buyers the choice of custom colors, it suggests a number of different graphic packages including an American flag and camouflage. Mechanically, this is the only product that also produces 50% more electricity annually, will generate power and winds as low as 4 miles an hour and as high as 130 mounted close to the ground so it will avoid wildlife and birds. Well, I guess I can understand that. Design is everywhere, folks. Whether it's your toothbrush, your vehicle, your toaster oven, or the computer where you're watching this video, everything is touched by a designer. Art is everywhere. And the artists that help make these designs more utilitarian and beautiful to live around really deserve our recognition as artists that are making our lives better every day. Hey, thanks for sticking with it. Hopefully that was entertaining enough for you. Uh, we'll catch you on the next one. And again, if you like this one, give it a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. It goes a long way. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Hopefully it was informative for you. Again.